55 wins, 24 losses. That was the record of both the Timberwolves and Nuggets heading into their fourth and final matchup of the season. The catalyst behind Minnesota's success has been a near-flawless defensive season anchored by the favorite for Defensive Player of the Year. Through 79 games, they had held opponents to 109 points every 100 possessions, nearly 7 points better than the league's average, which would land 16th in NBA history. On the other side, though, was the frontrunner for his third MVP, Nikola Jokic, who continues to build his case as one of the best offensive players ever. Like in most of their matchups, the Wolves started Gobert on Aaron Gordon. But without Towns, that left Nas Reed who got the Jokic assignment. Of course, the idea is to have Gobert playing free safety, roaming the baseline so that he can take away the basket. And the reason this works as well as it does is because Gordon's not a threat to shoot. So when Rudy sags off without closing out, he's not going to make the defense pay. As for Reed, he's got some great defensive qualities. He's quick on his feet and has incredible length here poking the ball right out of Jokic's hands to force a turnover. The biggest difference between him and Cat in this specific matchup, though, is physical strength. When Jokic operates out of the post, he has no trouble at all working his way in close for a bucket. On this next one, it's a deep post seal early in the possession, and because Rudy started up top, it's an awkward rotation for him to come down and help. Jokic catches and patiently waits for the perfect opportunity to drop in to plus a foul. After that, Nas Reed took his first break of the game, to which Minnesota went with Gobert as the matchup. Of course, his natural instinct as a defender is to prioritize the paint, so when Jokic puts him in inverted pick and roll, he's left with a ton of room to set up from three. They can also go to a more traditional pick and roll, where Rudy plays drop coverage to near perfection and baits Reggie Jackson into forcing a tough shot. Only, helping off of Jokic to contest the ball left the defense with nobody to keep him off the glass. Once Rudy checked out, Nas entered to play the five, and the Wolves tried yet another look, now with Kyle Anderson on the big fella. Now Rudy's paint presence is missing, so when Denver goes to some set action, KCP essentially walks into a layup. The real problem here is that Anderson simply isn't big enough to offer real resistance against Joker. After establishing deep position, all he has to do is turn and finish through contact for another chance at three. Despite seeing three different looks, Jokic cruised his way to 11 first quarter points on 5 of 6 shooting. But without him in the game to start the second, the Nuggets had no counter to Gobert's drop coverage. On this one, Reggie's looking for a lob to Gordon, but the three-time Defensive Player of the Year plays it perfectly, and the result is an awkward layup attempt. Here it is again. Gordon angles the screen in a way that allows Reggie to build downhill momentum, only to run into a skyscraper that's waiting in front of the rim. Rudy completely took away the paint during these minutes. First, he leaves Gordon to not let Reggie get a shot up, knowing that he doesn't have to close out hard. Gordon drives off the catch, and once again that attack leads to nothing of substance. There's just one problem though. With all of this defense, the Wolves couldn't create any sort of offense against Denver's switch everything bench unit, which means that when Jokic checked back in, the Nuggets actually had a one-point lead. Minnesota went back to the double big lineup that opened the game, except now they had Gobert on Jokic, with Reed roaming the baseline as that second rim protector. Maybe the biggest benefit of having two centers is how it helps them rebound the basketball. Remember earlier when Gobert left Jokic, it resulted in an easy putback. Now Nas is there to help close the possession. And with Rudy on Joker, that means he's almost always going to be involved in the primary action. This time it's a pick and roll, and with Gobert in that drop, Jokic is left unattended on the perimeter. Jamal misses him though, and instead probes across the lane, where Rudy's masterful positioning gives McDaniel some time to recover and force a turnover. Joker countered Gobert's paint protection by attacking him out in space. Here, he uses a live dribble to drive left, setting up a counterspin back to his right for a soft touch finish. These plays were a mixed bag of good and bad. This time, he catches it in the middle and tries his signature floater, only to get denied by that 7-10 wingspan. After a few minutes, Reed checked out and the Wolves tried yet another new defensive look. 
it was back to Kyle Anderson on Joker, but this time with Gobert roaming so that he can't just bully his way to easy offense at the rim. And now the problem becomes that short mid-range game as Kyle isn't big enough to contest. He also can't competently defend him in the low post without fouling. We're talking about a near 60 pound difference in weight. Either way, it felt like Minnesota did a very good job of defending Jokic in the first half. They tossed different looks at him, shut off the paint from his teammates, only for him to end up with 17 points and 3 assists on 79% true shooting. But the best was still yet to come. It was back to the original matchups opening up half number 2, and the Nuggets started with their old faithful two-man game as Murray turns the corner for a floater. Jamal really caught fire during these first couple minutes, here using a sliver of room to pull up for a 3, and when he gets going like this, it forces the opposing big to play a more aggressive coverage against the screen. Leaving Jokic with a numbers advantage might as well be a death sentence though. Step up and he's lobbing it to Gordon, but on the next one that second rim protector doesn't commit to him on the roll, so he steps into one of his uber efficient push shots. The key here is that Jokic can pressure the defense in so many different ways. This time he doesn't even have the ball, and as Gordon sets up action, the movement of both him and Murray confuses the defense, leaving MPJ with a free two points. And then you'll see him initiate some off-ball action from up top. He hits Gordon in the middle, who flips it right back while screening. Reed goes under, and I think you already know what that means. When Gobert checked out, the Wolves once again tried going to Kyle Anderson. That lasted all of one possession as Joker makes easy work over the top for another and one, and just like that Rudy was back in the game. That's when Jokic went back to attacking in space. It's that exact same move from earlier with the drive left into a spin right, and although it gets played perfectly, that touch is unlike anything we've ever seen. Jokic's unrivaled combination of strength, timing and touch in many ways nullifies Gobert's one-on-one -on -one defense. He's in the right spot, but has no answer for the barreling 7-footer. Joker continued to play from out on the perimeter like this. Here Rudy leaves a bit of room, so he fakes the 3 to draw a closeout, which he then attacks on a drive. He gets the step and earns himself some more free throws. With Gobert battling foul trouble, now it's time to operate down low. With a catch, fake, and power dribble, the defense is at his mercy. This all carried right into his fourth quarter minutes. They set up the two-man game, and Rudy plays the paint on Jamal's drive, which leaves Joker with a ton of space in the mid-range. After that, Rudy refused to leave Jokic. When he hands it off to Porter Jr., it's on Kyle Anderson to recover and get a hand up on the jumper. Same thing with Murray. Rudy doesn't first play the ball, instead sitting in the passing lane, which leads to a floater. Another way Jokic can alter Gobert's ability to protect the paint is by stretching him. While initiating from up top, he has to be covered, so if any defender loses a cutter for even the briefest moment, that's all it takes to end up with points at the rim. Or he could force the issue himself by isolating in the post. This time it's more about finesse on the move than strength, but it once again comes down to perfect timing as he patiently waits for an angle, and most importantly that soft touch off the glass. In a last ditch effort to keep the ball out of Jokic's hands, Gobert jumps the next entry pass, but to no avail as he instead catches with a runway, forcing McDaniels to send him back to the line. From there, the Nuggets had all of the momentum. You've got Christian Brown doing his best impression of a Dunkademics mixtape, then you have Peyton Watson blocking his sixth shot in 22 minutes, which creates a runout and leads to another big time finish. With a little late game stat padding as we approach the final buzzer, Jokic found himself with 41 points, 11 rebounds, and 7 assists. Even more impressive is the efficiency though. He shot 16 of 20 from the field, 4 missed shots, 2 of which were on looks that he almost always makes. Because he struggled at the free throw line, he only finished with a true shooting percentage of 81.1. Only. The Nuggets had a scorching 138 offensive rating in his minutes, as he and the team got quite literally whatever they wanted in the second half. 
Whether or not we'll get a matchup in this year's conference finals, only time will tell. But the chess match that comes with historic defense trying to slow down an offensive GOAT is nothing short of a remarkable watch. If you enjoyed this breakdown, make sure to drop a like, subscribe, and turn my post notifications on to be first on more content. If you're interested in my more in-depth research, make sure to check out my website and social media profiles. You can find those links in the description. Feel free to let me know down in the comments what you thought of this game. As always, I hope you all have a great day, and I'll catch you guys in the next one.